Now I want to define one of the most important concepts in abstract algebra, and that's the concept of a group. But before I formally define a group, let's look at something that you might already be familiar with. If a, b, and c are any real numbers, then the following properties hold. And these are properties that you probably saw in your earlier studies of algebra. So first we have closure under addition. That means if you take any two real numbers and you add them together, you get back another real number. And then we have the analogous property for multiplication. Take two real numbers, multiply them together, and you get a real number. Associativity of addition says that you can move the parentheses around when you add. And we have the analogous property for multiplication. The existence of an additive identity. That says that there's a real number, we'll call it zero, such that a plus zero equals zero plus a equals a for any real number a. And we also have a multiplicative identity, and that's going to be the real number one. The existence of additive inverses says that for every real number a, we have another real number negative a, such that when you add them together in either order, you end up getting the identity, which in this case would be zero. For multiplicative inverses, for every real number a that's not equal to zero, there exists another real number, a inverse, such that a times a inverse equals a inverse times a equals the identity, and the multiplicative identity is one. Commutativity of addition says that you can do a plus b or b plus a, order doesn't matter. And we have the analogous property for multiplication. And then finally, we have the distributive law that connects addition and multiplication that says that a times the quantity b plus c can be rewritten as a times b plus a times c. And we can do that the other way around, b plus c times a can be broken up as b times a plus c times a. So now I want to take these properties and I want to try and get right at the essence of algebra. In other words, what can I get rid of here or what can I generalize uh, to still get something meaningful but to kind of clean things up a little bit. And that's kind of what abstract algebra means. We're going to abstract from these properties uh, some, something more general, something that uh, applies to more situations than just real numbers. Okay, well that's the first thing we can do. We can say instead of a, b, and c being any real numbers, and get rid of real numbers here, and, and just say that they are elements of some set. And, and we'll say in this case, since we're talking about groups, we'll use the set g, just to represent some general set. Okay. Um, also, I'm going to get rid of some of these properties here. So, commutativity, don't need that anymore. Get rid of that. And we're going to get rid of the distributive law, too. And so we're left now with just four properties. We have ones for addition and ones for multiplication. And we're going to let it work on some general set G. Okay, let's see what that looks like. Okay, so this looks pretty good, but I still want to make some more changes. For one thing, now that we're talking about a general set G, it doesn't really make sense to talk about addition and multiplication anymore. Instead, we'll just talk about some general binary operation that maybe could be addition or could be multiplication or it could be something else entirely different. Uh, so to avoid uh, taking sides here, I'll just call it star. And then uh, I don't need to have eight properties. Instead, I can just have four properties that all refer to this binary operation star. So now I think we're ready to look at the actual definition of a group. Okay, here it is. A group consists of a non-empty set G together with a binary operation star such that the following properties hold. And so we have closure, associativity, identity, and inverses. Closure says that if you take any two elements in the set G and apply the binary operation, then A star B should also be in the set G. Associativity, that's the one where you move the parentheses around, and since we're not talking about addition or multiplication, we're just talking about our general binary operation star, we can say that A star the quantity B star C is the same thing as the quantity A star B star C. Then we have the identity. So there's some element in this set, and I'm going to call that element E. That's 
typically what people use when they're talking about uh, identities is to use the letter E uh, in general. If we're talking about a specific uh, set G where maybe we know specifically what the identity is, we might change that and actually use it. But in general, we'll call it E. So there's some element E, the identity, such that for any A that's in G, any element A, A star E equals E star A equals A. That's what an identity does. It gives you back the same thing. Lastly, we have inverses. For any element A that's in the set G, there exists an element, I'm gonna call it A inverse, or the inverse of A, that's also in the set G, such that A star A inverse equals A inverse star A equals the identity, which in this case would be E. And this is it, this is the definition of a group. This is really one of the fundamental concepts of abstract algebra, and it's definitely something you should be familiar with. In uh, one of my uh, calculus textbooks written by Spivak, when he introduces the definition, the formal definition of a limit, he says that you should memorize it like a poem. And, you know, some people debate whether limits deserve the central place in calculus that they've been given in some books, but I don't think anybody would argue that groups aren't important. They're very important. And I think you should memorize the definition, maybe not word for word, but you should have a sense of what a group is and what the four properties are, uh, and be able to write a definition of a group in your own words. Let's look at some examples. So one way that you might see people write groups is in little angle brackets like this, where they'll put uh, uh, the angle brackets and they'll have two places, and in the first place, that's where they'll write the set that they're talking about, the set G, but they'll write more specifically what it is, and then in the second spot, that's where they'll put the binary operation. And it's just a compact way of specifying a group together with its binary operation. Now, a lot of times people get a little sloppy with notation, and instead of always specifying the binary operation, sometimes they'll just specify the set, as long as it's understood that we know what the binary oper operation is that they're talking about. But in these cases, until we get used to it, I'm going to always specify the set together with the binary operation. So here's an example. Suppose we have the set of real numbers under addition. Is this a group? Well, we know that the real numbers under addition satisfy closure, associativity, identity, and inverses. In fact, we know that under addition, we can say that the identity element is zero, and we can say that the inverse of some element, uh, I don't know, we'll say how about a, is, in this case, negative a. So I would say that, yes, this is a group. We know that it's a group. How about the set of positive real numbers under multiplication? So this set R with a little plus, that means the set of all real numbers such that x is greater than 0. So 0 is not in this set. Uh, OK, so is this a group? Well. Let's see, is it closed? If you take any positive real numbers and add them together, or I'm sorry, multiply them together, do you get another positive real number? And yeah, I think if you take any positive numbers and multiply them together, you'll get another positive number. Um, is it associative? Yeah, I think we can move parentheses around when we're multiplying, sure. Is there an identity element? So we should probably figure out what that might be. So we're talking about multiplication here. Where the identity element would be 1. And 1 is in the set. 1 is a positive real number, so that seems to work. And what about the inverses? What would the inverse of some element a be? Well, in this case, since we're talking about multiplication, it'd be 1 over a. And 1 over a is still a positive real number. So I'd say, yes, this is indeed a group. OK, how about the set of rational numbers under addition? So rational numbers under addition. Do we have closure? If you add any two rational numbers, do you get back another rational number? I would say yes, you do. Associativity, yeah, you can uh, move the parentheses around when you add rational numbers, absolutely. Uh, what would the identity element be in this case? So we're looking for our identity element here, and we know with addition, a good thing to look for would be zero, and that indeed is our identity element, and zero is a rational number, so that works. Do we have inverses? So what would the inverse of some element a be? Since we're talking about uh, addition here, that would be negative a. And if you take a rational number uh, and make it negative, is it still a rational number? Yes, it is. And so I would say that, yes, this is indeed a group. 
What about the rational numbers under multiplication? Well, this gets a little bit trickier here. So um, again, closure and associativity, if you think about it, those both hold. Um, what about the identity? Okay, well, the identity in this case would be one, and one is a rational number, so that works. But what about inverses? So the inverse of some element A, we're talking about multiplication here, that would probably be something like one over A. Hmm, I think that works for almost everything. Like if we had three, we could say that the inverse of three is one third. These are both rational numbers, but what about zero? Do we have a one over zero? No, that doesn't work. This is not a group, and it's because zero does not have an inverse. And if you look at the definition of a group, it says for any element in G, there exists an inverse. Zero is in the group. Well, it's not a group, zero is in the set, but it doesn't have an inverse, so this is not a group. Okay, last example, integers under multiplication. Um, is it closed? If you multiply any two integers, do you get another integer? You sure do. Is it associative? Yeah, when you multiply, you can move parentheses around. Is there an identity element? Hmm, okay, well, multiplication would say the identity would be one. One is an integer, so that works. What about inverses? So inverse of some element A would be one over A. And again, we have a problem with inverses because to look at the example of three, that's an integer, but one over three is not an integer. So that does not work. This is not a group. By the way, you'll see in some textbooks that when they define a group, they will just list these three properties here as being the group properties and leave off closure. I prefer to list closure as a separate property here. Um, but just be aware that in some textbooks, you might not see closure explicitly listed as one of the four properties. But for our purposes, think of all four of these as the properties that make up a group.